So we are going to our next chapter in Acts, and uh, I'm calling this Courts in Session, or Court is in Session, because it really is simply a court. It's like a, a court case, a court hearing. It's, uh, it's set up just like this. There's a, a prosecution, there's a defense, and there's a, well, there's kind of a judgment. So it's set up just like a court case. Paul had to defend himself. Uh, we're, we've been in Acts. We've been talking about the Apostle Paul. The, the, uh, we're, we're at the part where the three missionary journeys are over, and he is now, or was in Jerusalem. And so uh, we find out that he, is, he had to be moved uh, to another city. He was under charge. And if you remember from last week, uh, he had to be moved under armed guard. So it was an incredible number. It was like 200 spearmen and 200 this and 70 of that. I don't remember which was which, but 470 people to move one guy from Jerusalem up to Caesarea. It was like incredible. And uh, they, the enemies wanted him so bad that they wanted to kill him in route. And it was thwarted, but it was, uh, it, the point is that they were really after him. And now we are at the point where he's going to be under, on trial uh, there. And so I find this chapter, as I was going through it and going through it, I said to me, this is about finding truth. How many of you know truth can be a little bit difficult to find? Truth can be a little bit difficult to find. I remember when I would say something to my dad, he would often come back with this. How do you know? Well, dad, it's sunny outside. How do you know? Dad, it's raining out. How do you know? He wanted to know, how do you know? Well, is it really the truth that you're telling me? I don't know why you would doubt it from me, but... You remember Ronald Reagan saying, trust but verify. Because he was unsure with some of the people he was dealing with if they were going to be truthful and trustworthy. Um, you know, you buy the used car and they say, it's fine, everything's fine, everything's good. And... Um, Maybe you need to take it a little farther than that to be sure. So court cases should be about finding the truth and then justice being served. That's not always the case in many parts of our world. But let's go here. Let's, let's see what the prosecution's case is all about. So I'm in Acts chapter 24, if you want to follow along. And I'm just going to start right at the upper left-hand corner in verse number one. So Paul had been brought up from Jerusalem, and, and the first thing it says here is five days later. So it's five days after he arrives, this is what happens. Ananias, <coughs> the high priest. Now, you have to look at this and say, how bad did they want to get Paul if the high priest himself made the trip? But not only that, he arrived with some of the Jewish elders, not just Jews, the leaders. So the high priest is there, and Jewish leaders are there, all to present a case against Paul. And then there's a guy named Tertullus. It's spelled not like that, but that's how it's pronounced. I just picture a turtle and us next to it, Tertullus. Tertullus was a lawyer. So they brought in Johnny Cochran, or whoever you want as your favorite lawyer. They brought him in, uh, to be the prosecution, Cochran was a defendant, but to be the prosecution to present their case against Paul to Felix, the governor. So Paul gets called in, and uh, Tertullus presents the charges against Paul, and he makes his following address to the governor. You have provided a long period of peace for us, Jews, and with foresight have enacted reforms for us. For all of us, Your Excellency, we are very grateful to you, but I don't want to bore you, so please give me your attention for only a moment. We have found this man to be a troublemaker who constantly is stirring up riots among Jews all over the world. He is the ringleader of the cult known as the Nazarenes. Furthermore, he was trying to desecrate the temple when we arrested him. 
you can find out for the truth, the truth of our accusations by examining him yourself. And all the other Jews chimed in, declaring everything Tertullus said was true. Sound pretty convincing? A skilled lawyer, high officials, very serious about eliminating Paul. They couldn't ambush him on the road. They couldn't kill him in travel. That was thwarted. And now they're trying another route. Probably upset they have to go uh, this far. Tacitus, a Roman historian, described Felix. Felix is the governor. He's the judge, all right? As the master of cruelty and lust who exercised the powers of a king with the spirit of a slave. <coughs> he said this as well. Felix's public and private life was not a pretty one. He indulged in every license and excess, thinking he could do any evil act with impunity. So let's take a look at this court case here for a little bit. Um, the Honorable Felix, as we present him to you, all rise, don't rise, but all rise. Prosecution, are you ready to present your case? Yes, Your Honor. Um, so they say, Your Honor, Your Honor. Oh, before we start, I just want to say your robe looks lovely today. And, and who shines your crown? I mean, I can't believe how nice, I can't believe how nice it looks. I think you're the nicest looking governor we've ever seen. By the way, the Bible speaks against flattery. So they, they flatter him first, and then they say something. Well, first they say, all these nice things about him. Let's, uh, let's start that. Let me go back here for a minute. So you heard some of the things I read about him from another historian. And they said to him, you've provided a long period of peace for us Jews. Guess what? Well, let me just, I'm just going to put a question. I'm going to say, is it true or not true? And you take your best guess, all right? You have provided a long period of peace for us Jews. You are correct. It is not true. With foresight, you have reforms for us. We are very grateful to you. We don't want to bore you. Yeah, you guys are hitting it 100% here. Uh, and then he makes these accusations against Paul. He's a plague. He's a plague. He, he riots constantly everywhere. He's a troublemaker. He's the ringleader, and he's uh, of the cult of the Nazarenes. These things are all cleverly said because what did they want to do? They wanted to get Paul. They wanted him to be found guilty and legally dealt with. So think about these things. A plague, well, that's pretty strong language for who, what kind of person he is, but this is even more so. Riots constantly everywhere. Why would that be something they would want to say? They would want to say that because one thing Rome who was in control of all of this region, did not want to have, was riots. Riots were quickly squelched. If there were riots caused by Jews, the Romans came down on the Jews. And they did not want that to happen. Nobody wants that to happen. So the accusation is he causes riots everywhere he went. And actually, they said he was causing riots at the temple, uh, even in Jerusalem. And then they say he's a troublemaker. Well, that kind of goes along with the right idea. We don't want that. He's not just a troublemaker. He's the head troublemaker. He's the chief troublemaker. He's the ringleader of all of them. He is the worst of the worst. And then they say this. He's part of the cult known as the Nazarenes or part of the Nazarenes. Now, what would the significance, what might it be? I don't know this for sure, but it would have brought back memories of Jesus, who was a Nazarene, whom Pilate crucified. There was another so-called troublemaker, went on a trial and, and went before the courts and ultimately before and Herod and Caiaphas and Pilate and went through that whole thing. And, and, and they, they ultimately, Pilate said, crucify him. Well, if it was good enough for Pilate, Felix, maybe it's good enough for you. So all of this was pretty cleverly, you may just read it and say, 
okay, yeah, that's, I could think of worse things to say about somebody, but they weren't just trying to say bad things. They were trying to get him convicted. Truth can be hard to find. I remember saying to Jody when COVID was going on, anybody remember COVID? I remember saying to Jody, it is hard to find the truth of what's really happening. Where did the virus really begin? Who really knows about it? How safe are the vaccines? Uh, what about the boosters? What about other things that have been brought up as alternatives? How, how do you find the truth? Truth is important to be able to find. And it was hard to find. And so here you have a case where it's being presented as truth, but maybe not so fast. Maybe not so fast. We, uh, we were at, we, uh, Pastor Terry, Pastor Mack, myself, uh, Jody, were at our district council uh, this week. And uh, that is, the, all the uh, assemblies have got pastors in the state of Illinois, as many as can, we get together. So there was a large group of pastors. And we had some great speakers, just some great speakers. One of the speakers was Martha Tennyson. And she was part of a church, and Jody helped me get my facts straight here, but years ago, there was a, a, a drunk driver that, that hit a bus head-on, carrying 60-plus people, and the bus, uh, of course, was split, and lots of people were hurt and killed, and then it burst into flames, and more were killed. Like 25 out of the 65 were killed in that. And so she was there presenting um, a, a, a speech or a, a sermon to the graduating class, the ordination class, and those that were being licensed. And one of the things she said was this, people give us facts, but God gives us the truth. And you might say, well, what does that mean? And she used this illustration. She said, saw a man driving a Mercedes. And I said, there's a successful rich guy. But the real story was, he was someone who had borrowed the car and was just running an errand for somebody else. Did she see somebody driving an expensive car? That was a fact, but it wasn't the truth. So you have to be careful between facts and truth. People give us facts, but God gives us the truth. If you want to know the truth about, I'm going to get off my notes here for just a minute, but if you want to know the truth for something, there is no better place to go than your Bible. And if what you hear in other places say one thing, or even are presented as facts, the truth is the truth that is found in God's word. And the sooner that we make up our minds on that and allow the word of God to govern us, the happier we are going to be the more joy we are going to have, and the freer we will be. Somebody say amen. amen. So uh, the lawyer is presenting this case, and he is hammering this, hammering that, hammering this, and hammering that. And then all the little cheering crowd that he brought with him are, yeah, that's right, that's it, that's the case. This is true. It was a strong case. At least it sounded like a strong case except it was half true. It was half true. Remember what I said a week or two ago? If you take the truth, pull it out of context, and twist it just a little bit, you now have a heresy. Be very careful with somebody quoting some scripture to you and having it out of context and twisted, even just a little bit. It may sound true, but your proof is to take it in context and then ask God to make it, enlighten it to you. And that's where you get to the truth. So they said to him, you can find out the truth of our accusations by examining him yourself. Search for the truth. That was the one good thing they said. If you want to know the truth, search for it yourself. You will not really know the truth unless you've examined it yourself. You can have somebody else tell you the truth. 
But there is nothing that sinks as deep as when you've discovered it for yourself. Now you own it. Now you are not going to get knocked off the bubble and say, well, let my dad believe it. I'm not, I'm not sure. Now I'm, I, there's been somebody who's got a different opinion, and I'm not sure what my dad believed is true. You have to find out for yourself. I'm looking at Roebuck sitting up here, and uh, one thing they, they all work on, all, everybody works in children's church, they're trying to get truth from God's word into our children so they got it from God's word. Anchor themselves. And of course, as you grow, that becomes more and more important. Um, and, and I lucked out on this. To be honest, I lucked out on it. When I first was saved, I wanted to know if what I was reading was true or not. So I just went on a reading uh, binge. And I read the Bible. I didn't read it in King James because I didn't grow up with that, and I just couldn't do it. But I read the Bible, and then I read all the books I could find and get a hold of. And at the end of the day, it wasn't just a dramatic, oh, I was here and then I was here. But at the end of the day, I owned it for myself. Not because Jody believed it or somebody else believed it. They helped. But I owned it for myself. You have to own it for yourself firsthand. Somebody say amen. Acts 17.11 said, don't be ignorant. Be a truth seeker. You will not be able to stand against harsh accusations, uh, against differing opinions, if you don't really believe the truth and have discovered it for yourself. Amen. So now we get to Paul's part of this, and this is his defense. Is the defense ready? Yes, Your Honor. Where's your attorney? I'm going to represent myself. Are you qualified to represent yourself? Yes, I think I am, Your Honor. Okay, just know that there's no appeal here uh, if this goes against you. Yes, Your Honor, I get it. So the governor motions for Paul to speak. I'm in verse 20, uh, 10 of chapter 24. And Paul said, I know, sir, that you have been judge of Jewish affairs for many years. True or not, it was true. So I gladly present my defense to you. Yeah, if you're innocent, you're pretty eager to present your defense. And you will quickly discover that I arrived in Jerusalem no more than 12 days ago. To worship at the temple. Was that true or not? That we, we found out last week if you were here. That is absolutely true. My accuser, n accusers never found me arguing with anyone in the temple, nor stirring up a riot in any synagogue, nor on the streets of the city. These men cannot prove the things they accuse me of. But listen to this. I admit I follow the way. The way. What's the way? Well, early Christians, before they were called Christians at Antioch, Remember the, when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Well, who are these people? Well, they're of the way. They didn't finish it. They're just of the way. So I gladly admit that I follow the way, which they call a cult. They call it a cult. Here's what it really is. It's the way. I worship the God of our ancestors, and I firmly believe the Jewish law and everything written in the prophets. I have the same hope these men have. Let me skip to verse 16. Because of this, I always try to maintain a clear conscience before God and all people. I talked about conscience last week because that's the second time that this has come up uh, from Paul. His conscience is clear. Um, and then he, he goes on and makes his defense. He says, there was no crowd around me. There was no rioting. This is easy to find out. You can go find this out. Th this is untrue what they have said. And a matter of fact, if there are others that are bringing charges, they should be here. Where are the accusers? They're not even here. You got the professionals here, but they weren't the ones that supposedly saw something. Where are they if it's this important? And then they said, what crime have I committed? What crime am I guilty of? Every now and then, you'll find a court case where somebody will say, well, I don't understand. What's the crime? What am I being charged with? Where, where is an actual crime here that the law has been broken? So let's talk about this for uh, just a minute. He's representing himself. He said, there are plenty of witnesses that are still there. You can find out the truth. It's okay if you find out the truth. I was in the temple. Remember, Paul was taking a vow. He had taken a vow. Uh, and so that was, I believe, a seven-day vow. And he was in, in, in the middle of that vow or a little past that. And he was purifying himself, and he did not start the riot. They started, people from Asia, 
from the churches in Asia came down because it was Pentecost. They were in Jerusalem and they started the riot. But he says, I admit I follow the way. It reminded me of this scripture in Romans. I am not ashamed of the gospel. I, everybody say that. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Let's say it with a little more conviction. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew and also to the Greek. Um, and so I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I am of the way. And then he says, I'm on trial before you today because I believe in the resurrection. Well, all Pharisees believed in the resurrection, but really, in Paul's case, he believed that Jesus had rose from the dead. Because I believe in the resurrection. Actually, for him, uh, there was one more step there. Stand on the truth. He defended himself against the tax because he stood on the truth. So, you have to have knowledge of the truth before you can stand on the truth. Let me tell you one thing Satan hates. And I'm pretty, I'm on pretty solid ground here. He hates God's word. If you know God's promises, you have a very strong defense. Because ha Satan hates, you know, when Jesus was taken and tempted in the, in the desert, what did he use for his defense? Scripture. Satan tried to use, Satan tried to take scripture, pull it out of context and twist it, which was a heresy, and Jesus straightened that out with accurately handling the word of truth. Have to know it. Martha Tennyson, who I talked about earlier, said this. Listen, listen. Why don't we trust God more? Because we only trust people we know. I, I, I didn't write it, I just repeated it. Let's go on. Let's finish this up. At that point, Felix, who was quite familiar with the way, adjourned hearing and said, uh, wait, we're going to wait. We're not going to make a judgment. This is the non-judgment, all right? We had a prosecution, defense, and then a non-judgment. <clears throat> uh, he was quite familiar with Christians, the way. Uh, and he adjourned. He said, we're going to wait till the garrison commander, the one that rescued Paul, which they were upset with, uh, because he didn't let them, he def de de defeated their plan. And then I will decide the case. <clears throat> he ordered an officer to keep Paul in custody, but to give him freedom, allow his friends to visit, take care of his needs. What do you think? Do you think Felix really thought he was guilty? Probably not. A few days later, Felix came back with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish. And they sent for Paul, and they listened as he told them, Listen to this. He told them about faith in Jesus Christ. He is, for, he is in front of one of the most powerful people of the day, a cruel, nasty person who has strong motivation to please all the religious leaders and the leaders of the Jews. And what does Paul do? He testifies about his faith before him. Now, let me get through this, and i got a couple other things here. And as he reasoned with them about righteousness, everybody say righteousness, and self-control and the coming day of judgment, Felix became frightened and said, go away, go away. When it's more convenient, I'll call for you again. He had hoped that Paul would bribe him, so he sent for him quite often. Listen to this, after two years went by in this way, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus. Um, and he left Paul in prison. Two years. Two years. Felix delays the case. But I want you to, I had to repeat a couple things, and I did that for a reason. If you murdered lots of people, and if you were ruthless, um, how would you like to hear about the righteousness of God? If you were one of the nastiest people in the world and somebody said, and God is righteous, and this is what righteousness of God is about, and would you like to hear that? If you were a sexual pervert and, and, and Paul is talking to you about self-control, would you like to hear that? 
No. And then if you talk about judgment, would you like to hear that? Go away. Go away for now. Leave me alone. Two years, Paul was left just kind of in limbo. Does that seem fair to you? Now, you're not sure, and I understand it. This is what Martha Tennyson said. Now, remember, bus crash, 25 of their children and some of their leaders were killed. In one case, one person was burned so badly they couldn't identify him, but his Bible was untouched. I mean, it's just... And you say, well, I'm not sure I understand it. This is what she said, and this might be something for you to remember. We are not saved from trouble. We are saved from sin. We are not saved from trouble. In this world, you will have tribulation. Rejoice. I have overcome the world. In this situation, Paul did everything he could to share. And we don't know. I mean, I, we, I don't know. I didn't find it in any of my research. Uh, there may be something out there that I didn't see. But at this point, I don't know if what Paul said to Felix changed him. And if he decided to follow the way his wife was Jewish, I don't know. Or if he just continued in his old ways. But the responsibility that we have is simply to share Somebody say amen. Missionary, you can't make somebody be saved. You can share. All of you that have been on missions, those of you that share with your family. So I was with uh, Dr. George and Debbie. And, uh, and, you know, it's so nice to have children's church workers that believe what they teach. And so we were telling stories, and, he, and, and somehow this came up. And he, he said, well... Um, I had somebody I really wanted to read something and uh, he was hesitant to read it. So I said, I'll give you a hundred bucks if you read it. Now I would suggest you all go to George and ask him what book he would, he would like you to read. <laughs> now, if you know George, I saw George once take a dime and he went like this and 11 cents came out of it. <laughs> I told you I was going to have a little fun with you today. <laughs> And he shared what belief in Jesus Christ is all about. A deep commitment to make a mark everywhere we can. Paul, even in the face of, you know, potential real rejection and being found guilty because of sharing this, still did it. I think there's a real lesson in here for you and me. And how far will we go? And I'm not saying be, be purposely turn people off. But I will tell you, there's probably times when we should have stepped out and we didn't. I know there's times when I, when I look back and I say, I should always pray when I'm in a situation I'm unsure of and say, Lord, what do you want me to do? Because if you don't, you can just kind of freeze and go past something. And then in hindsight, you say, I wish I would have taken advantage of that. And George, I commend you for you and Debbie and, offer for doing that and for teaching our, our kids that. So here we have a court case about trying to find, I think it's about truth. And truth, um, truth is in God's word. It's in God's word. And I just want to pray that we would be seekers of the truth, that we would be ones that are wanting to find out what God's truth is. When we see something we don't understand, we search it out. It's so easy to do that today. I've got books and volumes and, and stuff, but you, on, on the computer, you can search stuff out so easy today without even, I have special software, but you don't even need it. But we need to be truth seekers so that we can have the same confidence that Paul had. Would you stand with me? Let's just bow our heads for a minute. I'm going to read just a couple of scriptures. 
And I, I guess I want us to ask, as I'm asking myself, um, could I have withstood the charge? Could I have made a defense? Would I have been so bold as to even stand up to somebody who was obviously and much more powerful than I am? Would I be willing to do that? Do I, do, is the truth in me enough, solid enough? So let's just bow our heads for a moment. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. We are from God, and whoever knows God listens to us, but whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Do your best to present yourselves to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, who correctly handles the word of truth. I just wonder if there are others here today that would just say, you know what? I need to seek that out just a little bit more. And I want to be someone who can stand like Paul did. Uh, if you would say that, I, I just want to pray for us today. Would you just slip your hand up right now? Yeah. Thank you. Lord, we know that we're on a journey, whether we're young, old, somewhere in the middle. And Lord, as long as we're alive, we're seekers. And I pray, Lord, that Pray Center, that us, we, would be seekers every day, seeking your word and your truth. And Lord, I pray that you would help all of us, me included, to be strong like Paul was strong, to understand, to be clear, to be articulate, to know what he believes, that we are very strong in that, so that when we sing a song like, we shall not be shaken, it's in us, we shall not be shaken. And thank you, Lord, that you do give us your confidence. Now we pray your blessings. In Jesus' name, amen.